I use navigation for uh, most of my practice at this point. We're going to do lumbar pedicle screws here. We'll go from L3 to S1. Uh, one of the things that you're not seeing here is the, uh, is the zeme, which is actually the portion where we would do the spin. So um, this uh, cadaver has been pre, uh, we've already done the spin. So we're going to go right to the navigated screws. But essentially what we're looking at here, we're looking at the spine mask. That's uh, the, the striker spine mask. And uh, that is a uh, skin-based uh, tracking system for navigation. And so you don't, what it does is it replaces the, the need to put pins in the pelvis or, or a bony fixed marker. So my setup in the OR generally will be that we will prep and drape the patient. We will put, the, uh, we'll, we'll put this mask on and then we'll do a CT spin with the zeme. And then at that point, we'll kind of be to the point where we are currently. All right, so I'm gonna start by cannulating the pedicles. Uh, you can see we have Jamshidis with a tracker on them here, uh, and we're going to just turn it on so the Jamshidi is now speaking uh, to the uh, striker navigation system. And hey, Shiraz, can you give us a little bit of an idea of like, like how wide of an area do you anticipate, and then where should you put the mask? Sure. So there's a, there's a few different options for the mask. So when I'm doing my decompressions, I will put the mask around the area, essentially, of where I am working. Uh, the thing that you have to be wary of with the skin-based mask is that any time that you manipulate or move the skin, the mask will shift. It's almost like if you had a, a tracker in the pelvis that was bone-based and now you've moved it, right? So, so for a decompression where we're not experiencing a lot of skin shift, I will put the mask essentially just like this around the area where, where I'm working. So if I'm doing an L3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 1, any of those levels decompression, that's where I'll put the mask. If I'm doing a T-lift, especially a multi-level T-lift, uh, I will actually put the mask up into the thoracic spine um, and I will work below the mask. So the mask doesn't have to be surrounding the area that you're working, uh, even though it kind of gives off that visual feedback that it should be. So I'll actually move it out of the way. I'll put it up at, at the top in, uh, in the area of the thoracic spine and then I'll be working down low. A couple of things that, that are nice about doing it that way is that you don't want to block these trackers. So when I'm working with my hands, if I was to like lean my hands on this and I'm blocking the trackers, that's going to affect uh, the navigation's ability to see. So by moving it out of the way, I've taken care of that problem. And then I've also dealt with the skin shift problem where if I'm putting in a bunch of jam sheeties, I'm putting in a tube, I want to angle the tube, maybe I've got a little bleeding around the area where the, where the, uh, where the tube has gone in. Uh, any of those things that can result in any displacement off the skin, I've gotten rid of. So in, that, so in that scenario, I'll actually use the tracker and I'll place it well above the area where I'm working. So you don't necessarily need to actually work within the confines of that re rectangular space then? You don't. Oh, That's correct. And how many, how many levels can you do within that rectangular space? So, you know, kind of, it, it really depends on the size of the vertebral bodies. I think it's pretty predictable to be able to do like L3 to S1. Um, I think getting beyond that, and I think maybe the, the navigation specialists that are here can, can tell us if there's like a certain number of levels that are, that, that they say in the lumbar spine, which is what this mask is approved for, um, are, are, are appropriate. But I, I can generally do L3 to S1 in the lumbar spine. I will use sort, I'll use the mask in an unindicated fashion in other areas of the, uh, in other areas of spine, and then you can capture more. Uh, because it's really more a function not of what the mask can capture, but really what your CT scan can capture. Got it. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to pre-plan where my incision is going to be. So I put the jam sheety directly over, and I just want to get in the neighborhood here. This doesn't have to be a perfect angle because I'm just planning my, my entry point into the skin. So for S1, that looks reasonable. So I'm going to mark there, and I would, uh, and I've, and I've sort of gone ahead and done this part, but I've, I would put a little marker on the skin and just make a stab opening. I'm now going to enter with the jam sheety, and I'm just like we were doing a uh, a, a fluoro base screw. We're going to find our starting point, but we're going to find it on navigation. So the nice thing about navigation here is we can really see sort of our medialization, our starting point, and the fact that we're not violating a facet joint. So to me, that looks like a pretty reasonable point. We're aiming to the front of the sacrum. Uh, we are not going to violate a facet joint or the spinal canal. Uh, and I will go ahead and start my tapping my jam sheety. Uh, the one thing that you do that I do uh, say that I run into a little bit is, um, you know, not in a cadaver as much, but I like to kind of let go of the jam sheety after every several millimeters and just make sure that my trajectory 
is what I think it's supposed to be. So I'm going to let go, and I'm just going to make sure, because sometimes uh, in a live patient, if I let go of the jam sheety and it starts to sway as if the screw is going, uh, as if the jam sheety is going to go out laterally, you really have to almost hyper exaggerate um, the the medialization uh, of your uh, of your pedicle screw. So I'm going to go ahead and tap the jam sheety in. I'm going to watch it on navigation. I can feel the change in the bone. I feel like I'm uh, pa just entering past the pedicle here and towards the vertebral body. And at this point, I'll just switch over, take the jam sheety out, and pass my guide wire. So this is a non-CT-based scan, though. Is that right? Or is this uh, no, this is, well, I mean, it's, it's a three-dimensional fluoroscopic image. Um, I guess I don't know if I'd call it a true CT scan like, uh, like some of the other uh, units are, but it's, it's, uh, you know, it does give you a three-dimensional reconstruction similar to the ISO-C. Um, I think, you know, and, and that's really just based on the, uh, on the type of scan that we're, we're doing. So this patient had a CT scan done, uh, or this cadaver, I should say, had a CT scan done. Um, so I, I generally will use this, the na my navigation um, back home uh, with the Zeem, and the Zeem sort of goes back and forth between 2D and 3D fluoroscopy. But you can use it with the O-arm, you can use it with uh, Brain Lab, et cetera. So you, you, know, you can use the navigation instruments with anything, but I, I just prefer the spine mask uh, because it allows me to avoid having to place pins in the pelvis, and, so, and it functions very nicely with, with uh, the Zeem. Um, because remember, I mean, you're, you're able to do a significant portion of your work navigated, but some of the things that you can't navigate, like when, uh, when Dr. Singh comes in to pass, pass the rod and put down the, uh, and put down the, um, the end caps and things, those are things that are non-navigatable. So you want to have a C-arm in for those, for those areas. And so being able to not have to like change out a machine, get a different machine, et cetera, uh, can be pretty helpful. Make sure that you make it difficult for him to put in the, the rod. Oh, you, you know it. Uh, <laughs> all right, so again, so here I'm at L5 now. You know, we can see uh, kind of an enlarged facet. I can probably come a little bit more lateral here to really get r a better starting point, I think. And then we'll go ahead and uh, start to tap down. Now, your incisions for 5 and 1 are, are spread apart, but sometimes they're really close, right? So Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, we, I will, if it happens to, that the jam sheeties just best fit through the same incision, uh, I will do that. And then I'll just connect the, you know, I'll just make the incisions a little bigger. I mean, the incisions really, for your jam sheetie and your guide wires, it doesn't matter where your incisions are. Uh, it matters more when you're putting your screws in and you have to put your, uh, and you have the, uh, the extenders, the, the extended tabs on the screws, that's where the incisions matter more. Um, and so, yeah, when I, for this portion, I don't really worry about sort of uh, the, the incisions as much, but I'll be more cognizant of it um, as I'm passing uh, the actual screws down. How about your starting point on the, on the posterior aspect of the um, uh, elements? I mean, do you, do you aim towards the junction of the SAP and the TP? Yeah, or? so I always tell my, you know, whenever I have the fellows or the residents, what I'll tell them is, you know, you want to sort of be visualizing this just like you're doing an open screw. So, you know, I want to feel the TP. So I want to put this, you know, put my jam sheety down nice and easy, feel the transverse process, which I should be on there. And then I want to walk it into that junction of the transverse process and the facet joint and that should really give me, you know, a nice ideal uh, starting point. So that looks pretty good there for four. You know, the nice thing is I'm not having to wear any lead. I'm not having to radiate my hands, my eyes, etc. cetera. So, so sort of like unlike what Rick did, you're actually, this would be the first thing that you would do then, right? Because if you're doing some inner body work, that's going to change the relative. No, absolutely. So I position. always put my guide wires down first. And what I'll actually do is I'll have uh, uh, the, uh, the striker navigation has an ability, like they can capture that picture that we're seeing right now with the, with the blue dots. Um, we can do like a, dr we can drop that line essentially. 
And so that line is now fixed there. And we can pick a color. So like, you know, we, one line, like my side at L4, L5, S1 will be blue. The opposite side might be green. So this way, when I come back and do my inner body work, uh, even if the uh, even if I've changed sort of the the, re the relational bony anatomy by distracting the space, I know that as long as my my screws are now following the lines that I've placed, I know my angles are good, and uh, and as long as I'm going through the guide wires, I know that those guide wires are in the pedicles, so I don't worry as much. Even if you're actually looking at the screen, sometimes if you've really done a lot of bony work and changed the relational anatomy. That uh, that there could be that that the picture can look concerning, but that but those are some of the things that you just have to get comfortable with um, when you're when you're navigating. So just and, pass. And so what are you doing with with respect to the depth of your your guide wire? So you you you're, you're are you going as deep as the posterior vertebral body every single time and then advancing the guide wire a certain set number of centimeters? That, so, so my goal basically is to see the jam sheety enter the, enter the posterior aspect of the vertebral body, and then I just want to put the guide wires in so that, they are, so that they're captured. Like if I pull on the guide wire like I'm doing right now, I just don't want it to pop out. Once I feel that that guide wire has a bite, so to say, um, then, I, then I will stop. I don't feel the need to push that guide wire really anteriorly because... You know, as, as, as I'm sure we've all had, um, you know, have, have heard the stories or had it happen to us, you know, there are times when you can pass that guide wire too anteriorly. And ultimately, if we could eliminate guide wires, I think, altogether, that would really be the ideal scenario. All right, so I'm going to put in my last... Uh, Have you ever utilized that technique where you can actually um, place it into the pedicle and then lock it and then not use a guide wire? Um, so yeah, so I am, uh, every now and again, what I'll do is I'll uh, sort of change my steps. Uh, when I was doing fluoro-based T-lifts, you know, I was always putting the guide wires in first, then dropping my tube, doing the T-lift, and then coming back and putting in the screws. So I kind of maintain that same uh, the same order for my uh, for navigation, but actually with navigation you can you know you can do your you know it's pretty easy to do the T lift first and then come back and and if when I do it in that scenario then I'll do it without guide wires where I'll just walk um, an all a navigate it all and uh, and then and then just put in like like as if I'm putting an open screw because I'm watching the uh, the screw go right in. What are your indications for rescanning the patient? Um, the, the only time, if, if I'm doing a long construct and I feel, you know, and we haven't captured enough, or if I'm doing a navigated lateral surgery, then I will rescan when we flip. And obviously, if there's ever any question, then I'll, then I'll rescan. Are, are you using NAV um, for all of your cases now, meaning that decompressions as well? I mean, I am. I just need to now this a little bit. Um, I am. I'm, I'm using it for everything. You know, I think what's helpful is uh, the other thing that, that you can do with, the, with navigation is that you can take a in, uh, the intraoperative CT scan, merge it with your preoperative MRI. So for my discectomies and my, and my decompressions, I'm actually, uh, ultimately what I'm doing is I'm navigating the, uh, the MRI. What are your thoughts on, I know that like you're exposed to less radiation by utilizing navigation, but the patient probably is getting a little bit more radiation, don't you think? Yeah, so, you know, with the zeme, the amount of radiation um, is, is fairly low. Um, so it's, it's not as much as you're getting with some of the other, uh, you know, true CT scans. Uh, but certainly, you know, it's, it's something to be cognizant of. I think, though, overall, you know, it's really the surgeon at risk because we're doing three or four surgeries in a day. So the amount of radiation we're getting two, three times a week over the course of a day uh, is much more significant. And, and, you know, I think if you're taking enough x-ray, uh, if you're doing this completely fluoro-based, you're going to ultimately run into similar, uh, similar amounts of radiation. But, that, but that's something that we've talked about looking at and, and sort of randomizing and seeing sort of what the differences are in radiation exposure to everybody who's in the OR, whether you're doing fluoro versus uh, navigated. All right, so all the guide wires are in, L3 to S1. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't think that took very long. We'll, uh, so uh, Dr. Singh will now come in. We'll just, uh, 
um, go ahead and put the screws down now and pass a rod. So I'm going to, if we can have like two minutes just to change the mics over and everything. Sure. Sounds great. Any questions from the audience? Does the monitor in these cases know about it? Okay. That one. Um, Sh Shiraz, there's a question. Do you, neuro do you monitor this, neuromonitoring? Sorry, you know, um, don't, don't, don't get too close to me. <laughs> it's like, going to make out with me. Like, can you, so I will, uh, I, I use neuromonitoring for 100% for of my cases. Um, it's just the, it's the um, standard of care in, in New York to neuromonitor everybody. Sure. Hey, why don't we do this? Um, Dr. Koresh, you can make his way back into yeah. the, the, the room here. And then as Dr. Singh gets ready, and if we have any additional questions for Dr. Koresh, we can, we, we can ask him when he gets back in here as well. Bruce, do you need your monitor? Everything? Yeah, I do. I mean, yeah. it changed over time. I used mm -hmm. to not. Now I would say monitor it pretty much everything. Even decompressions? No. Yeah. So, Kern, can you hear us? Oh, we can't hear you. We're, I'm, on, I'm on mute right now. We're setting up, so. All right, got it. Give us a minute here. Any questions for Dr. Crash? Can you Krasik? get Dr. Crash? I don't think that one's in. It wasn't in. No, no, no. So, okay, I'm, I'm, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, so this patient, uh, we have some tilt. Give me the C if you don't mind. So just to show you, not the, not the tilt. Give me the C. So come over the top. So uh, for those guys who come with... You're giving me tilts. I want the C. No, no, that's let's, the C. There you go. There we go. Shot. All right, so this is Dr. Qureshi. That one is not into the interlaminar space. That was his navigation. Um, so for those who are, uh, I guess, our fellows, residents, I'm very neurotic about um, my setup in the operating room about, uh, about radiation. And so I know this is just about the, the screw passage and then ultimately the rod passage. But there's certain things you can do to help eliminate or to reduce, not eliminate, but to reduce your radiation exposure. And the first thing I don't see is done is, number one, we should go to low dose on the fluoro. There's zero reason why we shouldn't go to low dose. Give me a picture. Picture quality very rarely changes uh, on with the low dose in most patients in 95%. Second thing we should be doing is we should be collimating. So if you could tighten the image. There's a lot of things that we can do to minimize our radiation exposure to everybody. And, you know, so that's the first thing that I do and I recommend to anybody. Tighten it up even more and verticalize it. The other thing is you want to be comfortable when you do a procedure. So the cases that I do uh, in general in our hospital are, are typically degen scolies, some low-grade deformity stuff. And I always stand on the on the... The patient's right side. I'm a right-handed surgeon. The fluoro's on the opposite side of me. It's a little bit less ideal setup right now as the fluoro's in front of me. Uh, but those things can help you minimize kind of your radiation exposure. It can't reduce it like navigation can. Hey, but Kern, what are your thoughts on this? Though? Like if you, I agree with you. That's exactly how I do it as well. But if you stand on the, on the opposite side of the C-arm, typically you're going to be exposed to more of the scatter, right? One, 100% agreed, and that's a trade-off, and, and that's 100% right. If you stand on the ipsilateral side, you are reduced on your scatter, and that is the one thing that is a, is a challenge. You know, what I do is, for the most part, so I'm not taking much floral, a lot of it's feed, tactile feedback, I do take the step back. That's the one thing you can do, but there is a convenience and ergonomic factor versus the radiation exposure factor, and I haven't really been able to overcome it because I don't like the, the gantry, that beam, like, that, that part of the, the C arm being right up against me, it's just, I don't know, I'm claustrophobic. Like you saw Shiraz wanted to talk in the microphone. I didn't want him too close to me. I like my personal <laughs> space. So it is, it is a, it's a definite trade off and uh, it's a challenge, but it's one of those things that we kind of have to, you got to make, pick your poison, so to speak. So looking at this, the, the guide wires are nicely placed. Uh, the navigation uh, worked to its, to its uh, ultimate 
when I do, and for Rod Passage, I think that everyone in the room can do Rod Passage, nothing novel here. I just will tell you my tips on doing longer constructs. The, the challenge for Rod Passage occurs when you typically go across uh, two junctions, thoracal lumbar, lumbosacral, or if you're dealing with some amount of deformity and rotation. So in those cases, the DGN scolies, the low-grade deformities that I'm doing, typically my construct is bilateral, bilateral screw fixation at the proximal and distal end, and then unilateral fixation in between at every level. And I'm selective. Depending upon how the scoliosis lies, as you get down to the lumbosacral junction, I typically instrument five and one on the, uh, on the uh, convex side because it's more open. Because I think you mentioned something earlier, Jeff, which is five and one typically really converge. And that's a hard time to pass a rod when they're converging together in the same incision and it's a very narrow space and there may be some rotation there. So I try to do that on the, on the convexity. And yeah, you then know, it's, what else I, the other thing that I struggle with, I totally agree with you at five one, like typically like, like, you know, every, from going from L1 through L5, it's, you, you're going to get a li little bit more from the sagittal to the coronal, right? But then at 5.1, it can be very difficult because of the fact that the uh, posterior iliac crest is in your way. So if you end up with a more medial starting point at S1, then it can be very difficult to actually get that rod in at S1. 100% agree. And I think that that's one of the challenges. And certain systems are better than other ones. So we're, we're going to use uh, Pathfinder NXT here. It's a little bit older system just for conflicts of interest and disclosure purposes. Uh, I'm redesigning the Zimmer system right now, the MIS system. So it's Vitality MIS, which is going to be not a plug, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to replace Pathfinder. Pathfinder was a great system for reduction. It's a very solid tower. There are certain challenges with Pathfinder. If we could see the screw, it's, it's a closed shaft screw. Makes it a little bit more challenging. I'm not sure where the camera is here. Closed shaft screw, very tight and rigid fixation. It's, it's IP and some of its um, novelty was its fixation to the tulip. It's one of the most robust. Great for derotation maneuvers, for rod reduction. A little bit less so when screws align, converge. It doesn't have the malleability that certain other systems have now. Uh, I also, in general, typically don't tap. Uh, I usually pass the screw down directly because most of the screw systems now are very conically based. So you can engage very quickly and not have to worry about tapping. So you mentioned that you do bicortical fixation at the most cranial and caudal levels. So it's no, 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 bi bi bilateral fixation. I didn't mean bicortical, uh, bi bilateral. It. Do you ever do, do nice? bicortical fixation? Do I have what? Do you ever do bicortical fixation? I do it on long, sec on long constructs when I um, go to the sacrum. I do that tricortical area. I aim for yeah. the promontory. Mm -hmm. That's the only time I do it. Got it. So um, that, to me, is very helpful. Um, I'm just expanding the fascia. I'm leaving the skin incision the same. I don't know if we can see it on the, sc on the screen, but just the fascia down to the K-wire, just to make sure that's clear. Would you mind going over that bicortical technique at, at, at S1? Yeah, sure, exactly. So Shiraz was actually converging. And we'll see on his lateral. If we have a shot for the lateral, can we see the lateral? So you know, on my. And I'll, I'll go back to, at the very end, I'll go back to an AP view, and I'll show you. I target for the, you know, when you look at the S1 pedicle on the AP view, it forms like an ear, so to speak. You see the medial and the superior portion of the pedicle. You don't really see the inferior lateral portion. And I target for that upper inner corner. And then that leads you to uh, that sacral promontory. So this screw is perfectly placed. There's no, challenge, there's no doubt about it. And you don't necessarily need tricortical fixation, but if I'm doing like a T10 to S1 or something else, and I know I'm not going to the pelvis on a percutaneous case, then I'll try to aim that S1 screw out uh, for that, that sacral promontory. So we're just going to pass some screws down for the, for the uh, give me the shot, for the uh, purposes of passing the rod. At what point do you stimulate the Picture. screw, and what, at what point do you take the Picture. guide wire out? What are your, your uh, general guidelines? So in general, I take out the guide wire once I hit the verte posterior vertebral body just like that. Um, I, I don't scrim, stim the screw until the end. I don't, I don't stim a tap shot until the very end. So uh, I don't put in any of my, uh, I don't really tap, so I don't stim off of that. Some guys do that. 
and they can do a live active stim. I know certain systems um, have that feature, uh, but I just stim the screws at the very end. But I also, what, I think what uh, Dr. Fessler mentioned, I don't use a bullseye view, but I use an AP view, and then at the very end, after all my KYs are placed, I go to one lateral. Uh, but I do check my AP off of, and I go to an on phosphor, a bullseye view, and check them down the pipe. So I very rarely rely on the, the stem of the screw. But I think at our hospital, and I think Dr. Fessler can attest to that, everyone else kind of does that. So I feel like it's kind of the local standard of care, so to speak. So I, in some ways, I feel obligated, but I don't necessarily buy into it. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. So meaning stimulating Shut. the screw? Yeah, I don't know if you stim the screw or not. I mean, I yeah, I just, I mean, it, maybe it's just out of habit. But I think that the, the way I think about it is the jam sheet ne needle is like the thinnest diameter, smallest diameter, right? So then if uh, you're right next to the cortex and then you, you end up, the screw threads actually go through the cortex even medially, then I want to know whether, whether or not this actually has violated the cortex. Sure. I guess my question to you is how many times have you adjusted it based upon that? Very rarely. Yeah. Very rarely, right? Do you have a mal or something? So it's unusual, I think. It's I unusual, but I mean, I guess, I guess the point is you have it there. You're using it, right? So why not test it then? Uh, I, I mean, I do test it. So I just don't, I never really rely upon it. What I look for is more of a change. So I think this, uh, I look for a change. If I'm stimming and everything else is like above 20, and I, use, I use these 10 as my threshold. Everything is above, you know, it's, it's like 20, 30, 30, 30, and then one comes back at like 10. Then I'll go back and check that one on the fluoro um, and make sure nothing's off on it. I also use a threaded K-wire. I don't use a smooth K-wire. And I use power to put the K-wire in. So I let the threads find the pedicle and I let it pull forward for me. I feel like I have more control on that. That's just you know, subjective, how I kind of uh, feel it. So you, you use up. a powered K-wire? Well, I use a K powered K-wire driver. Interesting. So I use a threaded K-wire tip and a, and a powered K-wire driver. Uh -huh. And if, if you put the K-wire down, it first of all, number one, it prevents back out because it's threaded. Two, it actually pulls you into the cancellous bone. So there's no pressure. I advance a centimeter time, and it finds the center point of the pedicle. Hmm. So I don't, I don't really tap it. I think on this one, we have to tap this pedicle. So it's not advancing. Can you give me the, uh, we have the jam sheety. We have a, we have a needle driver. And a mallet. Give me a picture. Okay. Are there any questions about rod passage or percutaneous screw placement that I can help answer or address at this point? We get these things in. Any questions from the audience? Thank you. So Shiraz, what do you, what do, you do about um, the depth, right? Shot. So when I'm putting the, uh, I'll put the tube down under, uh, if I'm doing a T-lift, uh, I'll put the tube down using navigation as well. Uh, but once the tube is placed, before I bring the microscope in, I'll just take a quick lateral shot, and then that'll just give me like a sense of the depth of all my, of all my K wires as well. Oh, yeah, so I'm watching, so I have, um, so I have the, the navigation folks 
once we've got our trajectories, I will have them capture those drop lines, and then I will ba have them, based on that drop line, measure the screws out. So while I'm doing the T-lift, they are writing down L3, we've measured out to a 50. L4, we've measured out to a 50. L5, we've measured out to a 45, length of screw-wise. And then I'm watching as I put the screw in, they will, it, you see a 65, 45 screw again. going in on navigation. On your navigation screen, you're actually watching the screw and it's, it's to the size that the actual screw is. And then I'm setting the head, you know, based on where I want it to be with regards to the facet joint and the, uh, and, and the depth. Once my first screw is down, the rest are pretty easy because I want to line the screw heads up. So I just Plug. line the towers up. And so I'm not as carefully watching, but I could do that step sort of over and over again. But, uh, but at that point, I'm just lining up the towers. You know, the one challenge is like if you do like longer constructs, I've never figured out a way to do this, but the sizing is never right. You can never size off of the screws. At least I haven't been able to do that. Um, it's always inaccurate, so it's like a trial and error process. And some, uh, some uh, shot. Some systems are a little bit more accurate than others, but in general, it's kind of like a estimation, I think. Shot. Sir, are you are you going for a longer screw here? Well, we're a little bit limited by the screw sizes. Got it. Yeah. Shot. So I'm going to re-angle it to what I normally try to do. I'm going to force it on this cadaver, so I. Hopefully I don't blow out the pedicle, but shot. That's typically what I go for right there. So I go for that. I'm trying to force it. Picture. Shot. So I would normally go for a longer screw, but you can see what I mean by tricortical, so which is that sacral promontory. And if I was going to do a, uh, a longer, like L1 to S1, T10 to S1, then I would, I would actually tap through that anterior promontory. But we're, I think we're a little limited on our screw sizes. So, so uh, our, our screws are lined up. The other thing that, um, that people do or make the mistake of long rod passage, this is not necessarily a long contract by any means. It's not any deformity. So nothing challenging that I'm saying here. But... The thing that you want to do, I'll just use this dilator. Give me a shot. Can't see it, but I try to line the tulips up on the first time going through. So you want to just kind of envision what a smooth rod pass would be. And so if you can minimize that, it's helpful. And then some of the newer systems, and I don't know if, what your thoughts are, Jeff, in the audience, but I like to use essentially the longer reduction screws. They have longer threads now, so if you look at uh, Certain systems have 30 millimeters of reduction. So it essentially functions as a persuader uh, for your rod. And it's particularly important as you have a bigger patient and you have to cross thoracal lumbar and lumbar sacral junction. Those are the challenge on that. And the other issue is if you have a very steep lumbosacral angle, then you, know, you want to offset the angle by bringing up some of the screws, particularly at 4, 5, and 1, so that you're not looking at a very oblique bend at L5S1. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Um, I think that having the reduction screws makes a huge difference, you know. But you, you do need to line up the, the screws in the same sagittal plane as much as possible. Yeah, and I think that um, the mistake that's often made is that that's not done. And you, you try to just try to hug the screw down all the time. And then what ends up happening is you end up... Um, with a very oblique bend. And if you have that bend proximally, if you're going from the thoracic spine to the lumbosacral uh, spine, you have to adjust accordingly. And so you have this weird bend, it's hard to navigate. If you're doing something with, I don't know if you can see my hand, but I, I move my hand right or medial and lateral based upon the curve of the rod when you have a, when you have a degen scoli. So you have to kind of envision that. It's easier, and when I'm anticipating for, like a, for a Scully case, I will actually pre-op mark up on a fluoro shot, an AP shot, I should say, uh, an AP x-ray, where I'm going to place my pedicle screws just to line up, so that way I can minimize some of the coronal issues as well. So we have a rod I passed in. One of the things that you can just see, I don't know if you can see, but tip-wise, number one, I, I try to make the proximal incision just a little bit longer, because most of the systems, you have to get the heel of the... Um, of the rod passer through first, 
And so it's just these requires a little bit separate, a little bit longer incision. Alternatively, if I'm going to go thoracal lumbar lumbar sacral junction, I may make a secondary incision a little bit more distal or proximal to that, the, the first pedicle screw, and that helps for passing it. The downside is it places the rod a little bit longer, so you see a little bit more prominent to a rod, and I necessarily haven't overcome that. The second thing I like to do, can we get a picture? So second thing I like to do is I like to, um, I like to place the first screw in, the first uh, blocker in, and I'm going to assume, what I'm going to show right now is the rod is really proximal on it, and it's because it's a longer rod. I don't know if we have a shorter rod, but it's okay on some of these systems because you can persuade down with the, with the threads. You just got to make sure you don't have, some, you don't have um, a crappy bone that you're pulling up on. So we're just changing out the rod right now. And then alternatively, if you do a higher grade spondy uh, with, a, with a larger slip angle, then uh, sometimes rod passage is easier when you do, uh, when you go from the, the sacrum back to the, the lumbar spine. So how, how, do you deter like, shot? how do you determine whether you go cranial, caudal, caudal, cranial? Well, I think you do enough of these, you just kind of figure it out. But I think now I've learned if the slip angle is higher and you see like a, you know, like if you got a, a big booty spine, you see a big curve up and a big sacral slope, then I'm like, okay, it's going to make it much easier for it passing sacral to lumbar spine. Some of the systems have a new, have a different rod holder specifically for the lumbosacral junction, which can be helpful. You know, um, this system, the rod holder and the rod are in line. That's not ideal because in a longer contract with a big fat patient, you want to be able to drop your hand towards the patient straight down. Like if this was a big patient, ideally you want to bring the, the rod straight down to clear the fascia and then come underneath. So you actually want to have this a little bit offset so you can bring your hand toward the tower. So this is, a, you know, this is one of the earlier design systems, which was really good. It was an evolution of sextant, which was that monstrosity, the guillotine triangulation that was really retarded. You have to like line up everything and pass it through. And this was kind of the evolution of that for a drop-down system. But we've learned that your offset angle allows you to drop your hand, clear the fascia on a big patient, and then smoothly pass it. Alternatively, I don't know if you can see my hand, in a high lumbosacral slope, you want to basically bring your hand towards the head so the rod is passing straight down, and then you drop your hand back towards the foot, clearing the fascia. And oftentimes that can be easier. The second thing I like to do is place the proximal, um, proximal blocker in first. And the reason I place the proximal blocker in first is it ensures that I have enough rod proximally. Oftentimes when you, when you place the other ones in first, it holds it down and you may end up short dis, uh, proximally. So we'll place this one down provisionally, and we can see the shot. And so if we could open up the collimation just a little bit, or you could probably just raise your machine a little bit, I think that may be helpful. Shot. So we can see our rod. I gently secure it, because if you over-tighten the, um, the rod holder and the tulip, I should say, down, then it's very hard to disengage the rod holder. So I leave it a little bit loose. And then I start engaging my secondary and uh, uh, tertiary blockers. If it's a, more of a scoli case, then what I'll do is I'll sequentially tighten. So I'll provisionally put down blockers everywhere, just capture enough, and then simultaneously tighten across it. You know, the one thing is kind of unique on these systems, and you wonder why we don't have any monaxial screws or uniplanar screws like we have on the open deformity systems. In certain situations, it would be very helpful, but we have polyaxial screws, and it doesn't allow for good uh, rod reduction and derotation techniques. Agreed, but then if you did that, you'd have to be perfectly in the same sagittal plane then. Yes, correct. You, there, there are certain, there's certain IP around um, slides. You can, have a, you can have a tulip that slides medial lateral, hmm. uh, and there are certain techniques that will allow you. Biomet, I know, has an IP around that. But you're right, Jeff, you have to line up your coronal. It's a little bit less important if you're alternating fixation on levels. So you're skipping one level, going to the next level. So uh, we can see on that lateral view there, Kern, that the S1 rod is maybe about a centimeter off the bottom of the tulip head, right? Yeah. So do you, you know, like, in, I, I found out in some patients with osteoporotic bone, if that rod is riding too high and you try to, like, reduce it, oftentimes the screw can actually come out of the bone itself. So do you have any sort of suggestions on how to avoid that? Yeah, so I guess the disclaimer would be that we're working with some limited screw sizes. So normally I would place 
the S1 screw a little bit further deeper and longer into the sacral promontory, and then I would have left the 5 screw a little bit uh, deeper, but if I place the 5 screw any deeper, you guys would be wondering why I put my 5 screw through the anterior portion of the vertebral body. So I would have normally sunk both of those down a little bit more, but I agree with you. You can actually pull out the sacral, sacral screw if you're not careful on that, and that's happened to me. Hey, so um, Rick just um, informed me that there, there are companies that actually have um, monoaxial screws, like uh, the Depew system, Viper system has one, apparently. Yeah, I think, ask Rick, I think it's Viper 3D, because I use Viper extensively, but Viper, the routine Viper doesn't have it, but Viper 3D has it. Yeah, he's confirming that that's true. Yeah. No, I've used Viper 3D, and Viper 3D is very good for derotation reduction maneuvers, but, you know, there's a upcharge on it, and it's, you know, I don't know if we have it in our hospital. May Rick may have access to it. He gets all the VIP stuff. <laughs> I miss the working man on the ortho side. Shot. <laughs> so you can see there's not much force on that to reduce it. Granted, it's a very, you know, it's a non-scoliotic spine. I kept the proximal, proximal blocker loose, so it allows me to, to release off of this a little bit easier um, to disengage and it comes out. If you look at these systems, I don't know if we can see the camera, we can zoom in on this. You know, some of the design system issues were that because to hold the rod very tight, it's very robust here at the heel. And so when you really tighten down the proximal blocker, it locks it in. And then unfortunately you can't, because this system is straight on the handle to the rod connection, you can't release and pull your hand back because you're hitting the tulip itself. So in general, the solution is to leave the proximal blocker loose and then you can leave it sloppy, move up a little bit and pull out the, the, the uh, rod holder from the, the incision site, particularly in fat patients or bigger patients.